Hello, it's Denise from Women Beyond a Certain Age. We have a really incredible guest today. It's Christina Potters. And I don't know, Christina, if we've ever met live. I know you from Facebook and I know you from all your activities. So welcome. Thank you, Denise. It's just lovely to be here. I'm so excited. Okay. Thank you for asking me to come on. Oh, please. Now, I have to tell you, I know here's our story, Christina. A lot of women, women beyond a certain age, that listen to us will know you because they were in food. You know what I mean? They've been chefs. They've been personal chefs. They've worked in restaurants. They're food writers. But we got this, I don't know why, we've gotten this following of some of our listeners smack dab in the middle of their 40s. And I've decided that those young women must be looking for wisdom or advice or something. <laughs> Not really. Or to see what disaster is next. Hello. Or what disaster is looming in their lives. You said it. Now, so the reason I was so grateful because I do know you not near well enough, but when I've read your bio and read your blog, you are an inspiration. So this is what I need you to start. We're going to start today just simply saying this. Who are you and how did you end up living in Mexico for 40 years? I, I have looked at that phrase on your list for quite a while, that who are you? And it's an existential question that I'm yeah. not going to answer. But, um, I, well, let me start with a little bit of my, my own history. Please. I was, I was born in Chicago. I am 78 years old. And I have done infinite numbers of things in my life to keep my life afloat. And a lot of times I have said that work is how I support my life, but work is not my life. And in this particular instance, work has pretty much, this work has pretty much become my life. It's something I am passionate about, something I love doing, something I truly do not want to stop doing. Um, I write, I have a, a website called Mexico Cooks with an exclamation point after it. It's a play on words because in English, when you say cooks, you mean something in the kitchen. But it also means when a jazz band is playing really well, you say they're cooking. And that's, that's Mexico. Mexico has a lot, we call it chispa here. It means spark. And it has a lot of that. So Mexico Cooks. Um, the website has been online for exactly 16 years. Wow. For, for 15 and a half of those years, I wrote a new article every Saturday morning. It was published on my website. Everything from the most basic food that we eat here to an elderly woman that I met who cooked a fantastic dish in her town, to old time fiestas, to everything, every, a little bit of everything. Um, the articles usually run 1,500 to 2,000 words, and there are over 800 of them archived. Oh I know it's crazy. You know, Christian, people don't realize if they've never written, I mean, and you know this, that's in, that's several books. Yes, actually. it is. Yes, it, actually, you, I, know, you know, people don't know if they're not a writer, and I say this because people always say to me, "Oh, oh I'm going to write a cookbook." Yeah, right. And I say to them, "Uh huh," and, <laughs> and I'm not being—I don't mean to be negative, but I want right. to say it comes rolls off your tongue. But then when you sit down to write those three or four hundred pages, you realize that it's tough <laughs> right it is tough you have to keep your butt in the seat as it yep. were and your eye on either your piece of paper or on your computer screen and your head in the right place it's not easy it's not easy so writing. your commitment to every saturday morning i'm just saying is admirable because i realize it's a lot of work it and is so you created a whole career by doing that 
I did. I did. And the website currently has between six and seven million readers everywhere in the world. I have a little map on the on the right hand side of the website of where people are looking at it from. And one time I saw a little red dot out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And I thought, there's nowhere out there. And it turned out that some guy had tuned in from a cruise ship and was reading my website while he was cruising. That's so phenomenal. It was. It was phenomenal. And to, let me tell you a little bit about why I started the website. I've been, I've been involved in food here in Mexico for about as long as I've been here. Um, I, I originally landed in Tijuana with a group of people whom I had been volunteering with in Spokane, Washington, where I was studying a post-grad year in psychology and theology. And we were invited by the then Bishop of Tijuana to go down there and talk to him. He wanted us to, to work with um, people who were in jail, in the city jail in Tijuana. And it looked like a really wonderful opportunity to do something for humanity. And four of us went down there and you asked me if I knew Spanish then. I did not even know how to say buenos dias in Spanish <laughs> then, much less anything else. And, and it was really culture shock in, in a huge way. Um, I had been to, me to Mexico once before when I was 16 years old. And, and four of us moved down there, four women, and we, we rented this little tiny house and worked in the city jail where I saw things that I, I could really not believe, things I had never seen before. The, the first day I walked in, I was walking past a cell and a, a man's hand reached out and grabbed me by my shirt. And I thought, oh my God, yeah. oh, oh my God, I'm gonna die right now. I know I'm gonna die. And it turned out that he was, he had been in the jail for almost six months and had no money and couldn't, couldn't buy a lawyer or a phone call or nothing. And he spoke excellent English. And he asked me if I ever went to the United States. And I said, yes, I do. Why? He said, well, my wife and children live in Santa Barbara, California, and they don't know if I'm alive or dead. Are you going anytime soon? And I said, yes, I'm going to San Diego tomorrow. What can I do for you? He said, if I give you our phone number at home, could you call my wife and tell her that I'm alive? And I said, of course, and I did. And she was just, uh, it was just incredible how she reacted. She was so overjoyed. She could not stop crying from joy. She asked me if I had a post office box number and she sent me a money order to cash and give him funds to begin the process of getting out. And oh about, my God. About four months later, he was back home with his family and they sent me a Christmas card every every Christmas to tell me thank you for saving their lives. It was it was just unspeakably okay. wonderful. Christina, you can't tell me that story this early in the podcast because I'm going to start to cry because no. I'm so. I, and I'll tell you why. One, when people re there's several articles on. I want to tell people besides Mexico Cooks, your blog, there are several incredible articles written about you and your blog and I had read partially that story but when I was reading it and this is the tv the old tv producer in me when it talked about nuns and jails and prisoners and you're so working on your masters and you teaching yourself to uh speak Spanish I thought to myself this is a movie Okay, this, it, it's not just food. This is a movie. And the okay. fact that you were able to help that young man so soon in your process there is pretty incredible. It's what kept me going back to that jail. Yes, yes. 
it was it was a hellhole, Denise. It was just oh. awful. But but in the process, I learned to speak Spanish. Yeah. That was the only prisoner I ever talked to who spoke English. Oh, because so, his family had already migrated to San Francisco uh, to Santa Barbara, as you said. Yeah. And he was he was he was actually working as a as a coyote taking people oh. illegally across the border. Of course. But nevertheless, he was a really nice guy. <laughs> so so here's how I learned Spanish. I got up an hour earlier than anybody else in the house every morning and read the dictionary. And I made a commitment to myself that I was going to learn five new words and use three of them in conversation that day. And I did, and it worked. Um, I was the one they put in charge of going up to a public telephone and calling the gas company and asking them to deliver Mexico uses propane gas for cooking. Got so it. they had to deliver it by, by a truck. And I would write out a little script for myself about how to say all of that, that necesitamos gas en calle tal y cual. And, and I would write this little script and I would say the first thing and then they'd answer me and I was totally lost, totally lost. <laughs> but, but over the course of, of about a year, I pretty much could understand what was said to me. Yes. You know, receptive language comes first, like a baby. You yes. Know? So a baby learns that the mom says, bring me a diaper, and the baby goes to get it. But he, the baby can't say, here's the diaper. I brought it to you. Anyway, so I was living in, a, in the novitiate of a convent, and... There were about 50 young women living there, and they were from everywhere in Mexico. And the thing they were the most eager for me to learn was their mother's and their grandmother's recipes for this or for that and for all kinds of things. So I had a really fabulous introduction to Mexico, Mexican cooking okay. the, way, the way it really is and from everywhere in Mexico. So... Over the course of the next years, I got more and more involved with the cooking of the things that they had been telling me about. And at the end of about five years, I became extremely ill and was told I had to go back to the United States to recuperate. So I did. And I was, I was in the States recuperating for six months, and then I immediately came back to Mexico. And... And I've just stayed. I love it here. I, I yes. knew nothing about it here, nothing at all. And what I discovered is that the poorest people have hearts of gold. And people will take you in and people will, people will feed you. People will become your friends and people will take you under their wing. It, it's just uh, it, the, the poorest people, people who had nothing and... They will, they will do this for you. They do it for you. Christina, when I moved to Los Angeles from San Francisco, so I went to culinary school in San Francisco, mm -hmm. which the work in those days, this was in the 80s, most of the people that worked in kitchens you hired for prep or cleanup were Asian, okay? They were Chinese immigrants. You, right. not Very few people. It wasn't a Spanish market at that time. Right. Um, mostly Asians. So when I moved to Los Angeles and all of a sudden got a job as a chef in a kitchen, in the 80s, it was mostly men from Mexico. Of course, there were no women in those days. I was the only woman. But they were, and then as the 80s unfolded, Central America had the horrible wars and different things. So then Ecuadorians and Hondurians came in. But the initial core of the guys that were my prep cooks and my friends and my teachers were all from Mexico. And the thing that was amazing, speaking to what you just said, Christina, so I get the job, I'm not, I get hired. And then the chef that was in charge of the kitchen had a small problem with cocaine and stealing. And he was a nightmare of an asshole of a man. Yes. And so they fired him. Well, 
they they literally fired him and there were like 14 parties for the weekend. So they put me in charge because they were just desperate. Okay. Now, just desperate as shit. People always said, oh, you must have been so smart to get promoted. I said, oh no, these these jackasses were desperate. No. <laughs> the bottom line was we got through the weekend and then the general manager comes to me and says, well, you know, we were so hesitant, nothing to do with you, but why Hispanic men are never going to take orders from you. They're going to run over you like a freight train. And at the time I thought, I don't think that's true. So they gave, you know, so for another week or two or three weeks or a month, maybe I was the acting chef. And what I found out was these were the most adorable, loving, smart guys in the world. And you know what? They liked me in comparison to the horrible chef they'd had before. I got them raises. I bought them uniforms. I bought, I gave them gas money and I got them all a dollar an hour more raise. That's you know, within the first month or so before I had the promotion because it was obvious to me that they were the engine. Do you know what I mean? They were the engine of this train. Hard working, never complained. So the bottom line in that very short period of time, I realized that I'd be lucky if these guys would accept me. And then I stayed there, Christina, for almost four years. It was one of the best kitchens I ever ran the kindest but when you were speaking to it they would invite me to their homes on the weekend like I'd send it they say we're having a party Miss Denise come to our party and I would get there and I saw so the opposite is is I'm giving parties for the richest people in Los Angeles the richest people that are so rich that people don't even know their names you know? no and, I'm the right and, and I mean the richest people in the world and then uh, but I'm going after work to my prep cook's house and they there might be 10 or 12 people living there and they don't have any extra money. But you know what? They only had six beers and they offered me one. I'll never forget it. As long as I live, they offered me their wives would hold me and hug me and say, oh, thank you for everything you do for us. And I thought to myself, mother of God, it was the most humbling experience I've ever had. But it taught me things that I had not learned, Christina, about humanity. That's all yeah. I can say. So I that completely. The it's, word is wonderful. The, Changed the, my life. The Mexican word for you, Denise, is chingona. Oh. It means badass. <laughs> now I have to tell you, I spoke no well, I spoke this kind of Spanish. Donde esta la biblioteca? Uh, el perro en la tienda. <laughs> you know, all those incredibly bad phrases that I'd learned in eighth grade Spanish. And they would howl. So no matter what I would say, they would just howl. But you know what I found out, Christina? Much what you just said, and I was the baby. After a few years, I understood what they were saying. I could not, I'm still not nowhere close to being, I mean, fluent. But I understood them. And we may do in our pigeon, as I used to call it, pigeon kitchen English. You know what I mean? Because that's what it is. And you know what? Some of the happiest years of my life. So everything, I can, I know why you stayed. I mean, I can see besides the colors and the incredible cuisine. Right. So, so um, here you are. You're deciding to go back from New York or Chicago. And what happens? <laughs> Well, I, I met a lot of people who were kitchen people, who were cooks or restaurant people or whatever. And one of them became a very close friend of mine. And uh, on January 1st, 2006, he called me. What, we're going to go two hours, right? <laughs> no, no, no. We've got plenty of time. We've got plenty of time. He called me from Napa, where he lives, and he said, have you ever thought about writing about Mexican food in English on the internet? And I said, who would be interested in a thing like that? He said, you'd be surprised. And I said, but how, how would one do that? I mean, there were, there were maybe 10 blogs on the internet. Exactly, 
Exactly. I had no clue. So he said to me, well, he said, I use a web host and, and I recommend it highly. It's inexpensive and it's easy and you can pick a theme for your page and then you can just do it. At, write whatever you want and photograph whatever you want. And I said, my God, I, do, I have no idea how to do that. He said, I'll help you. Oh, how wonderful. Said, okay, I'll think about it. <laughs> so, so every week after that, he would email me and say, have you thought about it yet? This went on for a year. Good for you. And, Good for him. During, during that whole time, I was thinking, I was thinking about it. And first I decided to pick a title and it took me a long time to think what I wanted to call it. Um, I didn't want to be irreverent or, or politically incorrect or any of the things that people sometimes are in their books. Yes. It wasn't a joke is what I'm trying to say. It was not a joke to me. It was something very serious. And I finally hit on Mexico Cooks and I found a theme on his web host and I have never changed it. People say, why don't you update your, your, the way your website looks? And I say, no, it's been successful for me all these I get years. It. And if it works, don't, don't fix it. And I also think, I mean, there's credentials there, Christina, without you being flashy. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, I went to it and I did not think, oh, she needs to update this. I thought, okay, it's very clear to me what this is, Mexico cooks. <laughs> Right. And, you know, I, I write the articles. I, when people pay me a compliment that I believe is worth posting on the, on the website, I do. It's all, that's all on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, there are recommendations of other people's work. Um, I did, once I got going on it, the first week, the first Saturday in February of 2007, I put up two paragraphs and one photograph. And that week I had three readers, him once and me twice. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, how am I gonna get this thing up and running and people looking at it? So what I didn't know anything about search engine, blah, blah. None of that, I knew nothing about any of that stuff. But what I did is I looked at other people's work online, not Mexican stuff, but anything. And if I liked what they were doing, I would email the person that wrote it and said, I really enjoyed reading your article about whatever. And this is my website with a link. And if you read something on it you like, maybe you could put me on your blog roll. And they did, and they, and they did, and and it's it started growing like crazy. I couldn't believe it when he had said you'd be surprised. Let me tell I, you, I was surprised, and and I really had hit a good time because shortly thereafter, Mexican food was named as a UNESCO intangible world heritage and and people in the united states and in europe got really interested in mexico food mexican food so they started reading me with a vengeance and and it, i and every every week, day i would look at the stats for who was looking at my website and i was like wow wow this is incredible so i owe a lot to my pal He's still my friend. He just came down to visit me. I don't know. You know Steve Sandal, the guy who is. I know you were talking about Steve Sandal. I know him from uh, mutual friends and buying his beans and, you know, conversations on Facebook. Steve and I have been friends. When he was here, we were counting up the years. It's been 25 years that we've been wow. friends since before Rancho Gordo. Gotcha. Yeah. And. And he's a wonderful guy, as you know, and I have loved being his friend all these years. And he's the one who pushed me. So now, so from the website, I know you you are a, a sought after speaker, speaking as a, a expert on Mexican food. I know you do culinary tours. Yes, I so do. So did all that come 
from you starting your website? I started doing tours in 2003, so oh. before the website. But the tour business grew because of the website. I've never advertised anywhere. I've never sought out clients in any way. But because I have the presence that I have on the internet, people yeah. seek me out. And my, my claim to fame is that I do not sell canned tours. You know, I, don't, I don't plan a tour and then look for clients. The clients come to me and I say, what do you want to see? What do you want to do? What do you want to learn? Learn is the operative word. And they tell me, well, we're really interested in, in food, but we don't want to go to many restaurants. We want to go to other places, uh, street stands and people's homes and whatever you can plan for us. And I plan it and they take it and we go. In, okay. July, in July, I had people here also from Chicago and they were supposed to come in April. And they were supposed to get to Morelia, Michoacan, where I live. Okay. They were supposed to be here on April 8th. On April 1st, the woman wrote to me and said, you will not believe what I'm going to tell you. I am in the hospital with COVID. And oh. my, my husband has a lighter case and he's at home. And we can't travel. And she said, I'm not going to cancel the tour. I'm just going to postpone it. And I thought, I wonder. I mean, he yeah. is he's 84 and she's oh. 81. And about six emails into our discussion about their tour, she said to me, I have something to confess to you. And I said, okay. She, <laughs> said, she said, we're old. <laughs> and she, she said, we need a tour guide who is not a young 35 year old who will race us around and point things out and not stop and talk about anything. We need somebody who really knows and who will take time. And I said, well, boy, you have come to the right place. How <laughs> so smart. We spent two and a half weeks touring around in my state. And then we got on a bus and we went to Mexico City and we spent another week and a little bit touring in Mexico City. And then I handed that off to a friend of mine who is an excellent tour guide and things I don't do. And they stayed another five days with him. But that tour, it was, it was so wonderful because since the very beginning, I have believed that a lot of people go to other cultures in other countries and it's like they're going to the zoo. They're look, they're looking at they're looking at how people live, looking at how people dress, thinking, "Wow, this is really different." I want to read it, but but it's not an appreciation of of that they take in. It's yes. something they're looking at on the outside. But these people really took it in. They really really loved it. Um, it, it was a fabulous tour, and she and I were both totally dead by the time it was over. So, but, but that's the kind of thing I do, where, where they wanted to go to specific places. They're big fans of Rick Bayless. And, oh, sure. And they had seen his videos of a couple of restaurants in Mexico City, and they wanted to go to those restaurants. So we went, and they were just blown away and said, oh yeah, it's just exactly the way he showed it and we're so excited. And it, here, yeah. here in Michoacan, when the UNESCO named Mexican food uh, an intangible, uh, I forget how you say it in English, uh, patrimonio okay. intangible de la humanidad, when, when they named Mexican food that, it was based on the cooking in Michoacan. Oh! Not Oaxaca, not Puebla, not the names you usually think of. Yeah, yeah. On this state where I live, where there are tiny little towns with extraordinary traditional cooks, most of whom I know, 
Um, I'm the only non-native born Mexican who was ever invited to be on the organizing committee for a big um, cooks festival that we have here, a traditional cooks festival where 60 or more cooks are invited, vetted and invited to come and cook. And when they invited me, I was just blown away. I felt it was the biggest honor up until then. I've been on it since 2007. So Love. yeah, so it was fabulous. I don't know, you probably can't see this picture that's on the I wall. I can. Okay, that's me. It, I was about two years ago, I was named an illustrious woman of Michoacan. Oh, and, and, no, and you know what? You deserved it. Well, yes, I did, but it was, it was still amazing to me. All of this has developed over the course of over the course of my entire time here. Yes. And in large part, it's because people understand that my, I say, I may not look like a Mexican, but my heart is Mexican. And I, 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 I'm not going anywhere. This is it. So. I, it sounds what, you know, Christine, I have to tell you, when you said people that just look like it's a zoo or look at another culture or don't, don't immerse themselves at all or don't want to, do you know what I mean? They just want, they don't oh, want to. Don't want to. I was a kid at my, in seventh grade, my best friend, a, lo, a, a darling Jewish girl from you know, the wealthy part of town, went on an exchange program through her temple to Mexico uh -huh. and it was the eye opening and she went by herself she was 13 or 14 I mean I, there were other people from her temple with us but what I learned from that so she went for six weeks came back speaking fluent Spanish of course because you know she was young and smart well the best part was a couple of weeks later one of the girls from Mexico came back to her house and so we, her name was Lily, I'll never forget it, because Lily was Mexican and Chinese because her grandfather had worked on the railroads in Mexico. So it was one of those fusion. Yes. It was the most eye-opening thing to me, Christina, in my whole life. Do you see what I'm saying? And she yes. was so beautiful. And she picked up English language very quickly. And of course, she thought everything we did was fantastic. And we thought everything she did was fantastic. But this was the best thing. She taught me the first dish I've ever learned to make, which was tacos. Oh, okay. And, and I, I always say this to people. I say, you have no idea. I've made tacos. I eat tacos all the world. It's one of my favorite things to eat. I just think taco tacos are smart food because you can eat them. It's easy. She right. taught us to make tacos. And other than that little tiny fire that we had in my mother's kitchen, it was totally successful. <laughs> my mother, luckily, Christina was the type. My mother was an interior designer, not paid by other people, but she did it for all my father's real estate. So when she came home and the, saw the scorched wall, she said, oh, that's not a problem. I just, I can just put up some new wallpaper. And she was, <laughs> oh but I, I, oh, that's what so I learned weird. early. I learned a little bit about Mexican cuisine. And of course, it's still one of my favorite things to eat. But, you know, it's, and I, it, it's been, it's been wonderful to see what people now appreciate about Mexican cu cuisine that they didn't 40 years ago. That's true, because now, there, I know a woman who has a Mexican restaurant in Paris. I know a woman who has a Mexican restaurant in in uh, wh where Rene Redzepi is. Um, yeah. Oh, I know what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. But I can't think of it either. I Me mean, neither. That's because we're women. Beyond. Of a certain age, you know. <laughs> right? Christina, I say this to people all the time. Sometimes Cindy will say this, and this is why I love listening to you. Sometimes I'll start to say something, and then I'll tell her a story from 20, 30, 40 years ago. Or I'll say, you know, that was, I was there, I was in Greece, or I stayed longer because I had a boyfriend who turned into it, you know, 
this and that and everything, or I'll say something, or I was cooking in Jamaica and we had the hardest part of cooking conch is getting that little animal out of the shell. <laughs> and she says to me sometimes, I've known you for 20 years and I never heard that story before. I said, honey, when you live this long. <laughs> yeah, really, really too many stories for so many stories. And then sometimes you forget them and thank God they come back to you. That's all. You might like to know that my first job in the culinary world was as a Chinese chef in a restaurant in Woodstock, New York. Oh my God. A friend of mine took me, I had just moved to Woodstock. I knew one person in the town and she took me to meet some of her friends. So I would know people. And one of the people that she took me to meet was a restaurant owner. It was a little French bistro type restaurant and lovely. And I was practically a kid. I was in my 20s and I have barely knew how to talk to people. Yeah. So what I said to him was, I'm really glad to meet you. And I used to see ads in the newspaper that you had Chinese food on Thursday night, but I don't see that anymore. What happened? He said, oh, that guy was crazy. I had to fire him. I couldn't work with him. He said, but if I knew anybody in this town who really knew how to cook Chinese food, I'd hire them in a heartbeat. And I said, that's me. He said, you? I said, yeah. And it's a long story about how I really did learn to cook Chinese food. I specialized in Sichuan and Hunan before anybody knew about it. in the States. Oh, for God's sake, Christina. Uh, that's so fantastic. He said, when can you start? <laughs> and I, I had never seen the inside of a restaurant kitchen ever. So I said, well, okay, it's mid-October. What if we get past the holidays and I start the first Thursday in January? He said, that sounds great. So because it was coming up to Christmas, there were all these parties all the time and my friend would take me. And the first thing anybody says to you in the United States is what do you do? Absolutely. So I would say, I'm going to be the Chinese chef at the Bear Cafe. Oh my God, you are? That's fabulous. We'll go, everybody. So I went back to the owner of the restaurant and I said, How many dinners do you do on a normal Thursday night? Yeah. He said, Well, I've just been open for three months and normally I do 12 to 15. And I thought, Well, I can do that. Yeah. I do that at home. So I said, yeah, but I've been talking to a lot of people. And if half the people show up who say they're going to show up, we're going to run out of food in 15 minutes. And he said, what? I said, yeah. He said, well, how many people do you think we ought to plan for? I said, I think 40. He said, you're out of your mind. I said, I don't think so. And he said, I said, I'll tell you what. I, it was a fixed price menu with three different entrees and the rest came with it. So I said, look, I will plan for protein that you can use the next day if it doesn't sell out on Thursday night. And he said, okay, let's go for it. We sold 36 dinners that night. Didn't oh, we? how fabulous. And it went up from there. I And when you were talking about the Mexicans in the kitchen, there was one Mexican guy that worked in that kitchen, and I tried to train him to be my prep cook yeah. to do chopping, but he couldn't learn it. You know, Chinese is so particular in the way things yeah. are. Yes. Anyway. So I did all the prep myself, and within probably four months, I was doing 150 dinners a night. Oh my God, Christina, that's so much work. I can't, I can't even stand it. See, and here, here is my big claim to fame from Woodstock. <laughs> one, day, one day I went in at about nine and I prepped till six, which was dinner time. And then I cooked from six until 10 and dinner was over. So I went out in the restaurant and friends of mine were there and they said, come sit with us, talk to us, have a drink with us. I said, I can't. I smell like a deep fryer and I'm exhausted and I got to go home. So I left. The next morning, they told me five minutes after I left, John Lennon walked in and wanted Chinese food. So my big claim to fame is I never got to cook for John Lennon. <laughs> you were ships past 
in the night. It, it was great. I could I cooked for everybody. I don't know if you ever knew um, Albert Grossman, the head of Bearsville Records. Sure. Todd and yes. Paul Butterfield taught me how to drink tequila. Oh my God. I mean, it, those were the days in Woodstock. I know, I know. It was just a couple of years after the festival, and fabulous. I just think that you're an example, which is what the whole idea behind women behind a certain age was. You, yeah, you got bad knees and your eyesight and your hearing may be going. And speaking of myself, but I'm wise. I know a lot from from living this long. Absolutely. So I. I think you are a perfect example of that. Thank you for sharing with us today. I want our listeners to know we're going to turn around and do a second podcast and talk about tortillas because yes. we love to talk about food here because that's what Cindy's in my background was in the last almost 40 years. Well, not Cindy's is not that old. I, poor Cindy gets ages, decades every time I'm with her, I think. So Christina... Thank you so much for today. Um, we, when we broadcast, we put up links to everything. So people can find you if they want to go on a tour or hire you for a tour. I, I know I would. And again, I thank you so much. If people want to reach Cindy and I, you go to Women Behind a Certain Age, our Facebook page, and uh, Women Beyond at iCloud.com. You can send us a message. You can send us information. You can send us something you want us to know that you learned from the, from the broadcast. So that's our story. And again, Christina, thank you so much. Thank you, Denise. It's been lovely. And next time yes. in the next podcast, we're going to talk about the tortilla. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about corn. The, oh, perfect. A little bit about the history of corn. All corn in the world comes from Mexico. See, what a great, look at you, teasing, as we say in the business, teasing the podcast. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and we will talk to you again soon. Thank Good. you, Cindy, for always doing for everything that Cindy does, and Christina, and we'll talk to you again. Bye-bye.